This episode was with my floral DNA. One of my favorite parts of this episode is when we get into DNA fingerprinting. DNA fingerprinting gives the breeder or pheno hunter the ability to catalog genetics by DNA sequencing using something called a CCI, Certificate of Cultivar Identity. This will give growers the ability to verify if they are growing the right genetic by simply sending in a leaf. Something else that is really cool is that it gives the ability for the end user to also verify the genetic they are partaking in by a MyFloral DNA QR code on the packaging of the flower or concentrate. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you guys for making the flight out. Home base is Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you. It's thank a pleasure you to be for having us. Dr. Fernandez, Dr. Adnan, why don't you, uh, Dr. Fernandez, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? And I'll move on to Dr. Adnan. So in, uh, my name is Angel Fernandez. Uh, I'm um, the CEO and co-founder uh, at My Flora DNA. In addition, I'm a scientist uh, at UC Berkeley. I'm originally from Spain. I did a PhD in between Spain and, and Japan, Kyoto University. And then in 2013, I got a European fellowship for my postdoc at UC Davis. This is how I got here. I really like the, the science uh, and the system, the UC system, so I decided to stay a few more years in, in Berkeley. And I have been working basically more than 15 years in other crops, uh, always in genetics, in genomics. Um, and two, th- two, two years ago, with, with my, my best friend, uh, who is still in, in Spain, he's a business guy, we were talking about the real need of bringing the DNA technologies that we are applying in academia to the, to the real industry, to the industry in general. And we find out that uh, cannabis is an amazing crop uh, and uh, very challenging, actually. And unfortunately, didn't have the enough resources and then enough scientific knowledge uh, as other crops. So that's why we decided to to start this this business, which the main goal is to bring all the knowledge and the science that we have into the cannabis industry. And now you're CEO of My Floral DNA. That's correct. Right on, Doctor Anon. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thank you, Brandon. So my name is Ajit Anand. I am the VP of R&D, Research and Development at MyFlora DNA. Before my tenure with uh, MyFlora DNA, I was working on the row crops. I had uh, 15 years of experience working on multiple row crops, corn, soybean, wheat, rice, and you name it. I am a molecular biologist and a genomics person by training. And my expertise in the area of row crops was bringing the science and data together to drive a big organization, which is Corteva AgriSciences, and lead that into some of the translation R&D, which was then commercialized. The reason I decided, you know, I have a significant amount of experience in the corporate world, so bring this knowledge to a new crop, which is the fifth largest crop now, which is cannabis apply this science and data to a crop which needs more dedicated breeding, genomics, and as well as the knowledge of how to go diagnostics in terms of applying these things to integrate and apply it into a crop that needs some real hard work to be done. And that is my excitement uh, brought me to the world of cannabis. My pleasure of working with uh, in the ag field starts with uh, Professor M.S. Swaminathan, who is also considered as the father of green revolution in India. He was one of the first person to come with this coin of, uh, I mean, a terminology called sustainable agriculture. I see there is a lot of value for sustainable agriculture to many crops, including cannabis. So we are in the forefront of advancing a crop that needs something that needs to be done at the community base, at the education level, and applying some of the knowledge that we have gained in other crops, which have been sort of integrated into our agriculture system. Dr. Fernandez, can you explain what my floral DNA is as a company and what it does? 
So we have uh, two different areas uh, or divisions. The first one is uh, we provide uh, genomic direct genomic services or fast services to our clients, which are basically tissue culture labs, growers, and breeders. Um, within that uh, fast service division, uh, our strength is uh, pathogen detection. Uh, we provide um, a wide range of uh, uh, analysis, including uh, HLV. And then we have uh, another R&D division. So we are always trying to improve the protocols. We are trying to add new, new testing services uh, into our portfolio and develop new genomic tools that they can be uh, useful and efficient uh, to our clients. Are there other viruses other than hop and virus that you're that you're testing for? Yeah, we are adding. Well, we have uh, a, a package of uh, six, seven different viruses, including uh, bitcarly, including lettuce chlorosis, and so on. Six, seven different v- viruses. And are all these viruses prevalent in in cannabis that you're seeing? Yes, yes. So some of these kind of viruses have been reported, and people have uh, talked about this viruses in cannabis, you know, the beet curly uh, virus that is, and then you have the lettuce curly virus. So It's called beet curly? Uh, B- BCTV. Okay. Yeah. BCTV? Uh-huh. BCTV. I haven't heard of it yet. No. And then there is a lettuce chlorosis virus. Then there is a cannabis, um, uh, uh, what is it, CC. V, that is, there is another uh, virus that's very much known in, and then we have uh, also the uh, AMV, the alpha alpha mosaic virus. So these have been reported in cannabis. In cannabis. Okay, uh, yes. What's What's interesting is a lot of cultivators in the commercial field of cannabis production and cultivation, mm-hmm. m- many of them don't know about hoplite and viroid, which it sounds you're saying that hey. This is very common BCTV virus, and and you know it's very known. But mm-hmm. I, I don't think possibly it is really known. And and as as far as scale commercial cannabis production and cultivation, um, and knowing that hoplite virus, hoplite viroid, which for for me, it's really well known. Um, Going into some commercial facilities, surprisingly, I see that a lot of these cultivators don't don't know what hoplite and virus is or how it's affecting their crop. Right? Mm-hmm. How does BCTV affect crops on a visual basis, or what what have you what reports have you gotten on 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 other viruses and how they affect the crop? That's a very interesting question. So many of the cannabis. Uh, cultivators and breeders do not see a huge economic loss with other known viruses. But uh, viruses by itself, even they are in the plant, you know, it's, an, a, it's a pathogen, right? It, it does bring a lot of metabolic influx uh, in the plant. The plant has to uh, sort of put its resources to fight against these pathogens. So obviously some of these pathogens have visual symptoms, um, like the bees, uh, beet curly, uh, top virus, which is, which is a BCTV, it can show uh, chlorosis, uh, leaf deformation, and other symptoms, but it's like more often reported in other crops than, and the, the fact that cannabis grows with other crops, vegetables, and, uh, you know, which is in the growing area, the, the viruses can move around. And some of these viruses have been reported, and um, we are trying to learn about these things as we start figuring out what actually happens and how it uh, interplays with other pathogens. Because remember, plants are always exposed to a lot of microfauna. There is a lot of microbial things that are happening. And in cannabis, nobody has really looked at the resistance pathway, like disease resistance that I've been working on in other crops, uh, or managing known resistance that we can breed into the crops. So it's only a matter of time when we start seeing uh, the, the, the you know negative effects of these pathogens in cannabis, our focus has been purely on HLVD because people know it causes the dudding or the dead disease, right? And there is a known um, fact that if the plants are infected, and we know that the resistance of cultivar severity goes back to the fact that it depends on these 
cultivars that we're using. So when we start thinking about HLVD, everybody is concerned about how much it results in the plants being dead, stunted in growth, brittle stems, leaf deformation, chlorosis, reduced vigor in the growth, flower, and as well as the terpenes and cannabinoids that are produced. So I mean, you can see people reporting as much as like 50s or 70% reduction in THC, for example. That's sort of a real, you know, uh, sustained study on some of the other viruses hasn't been done. And I think it's a matter of time people will unravel that. And that's where the science comes into play. And that's that's what you're hearing from Hoplay and Viroid, HLV, as far as the... The main symptoms. Yeah. The main symptoms that are yeah. significantly impacting um, yield, terpenes, THC, growth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this all in scientific literature. I mean, uh, if you follow these things, I mean, they have been documented. There are a few labs which have actively been trying to educate the scientific community and the cannabis growers and breeders that, you know, what are the common, I mean, common symptoms you see with these white arts? Why do you think it's important for commercial cultivations to detect it early? There's a few things that we need to know about HLVD. So HLVD is caused by a viroid. And viroid are the smallest RNA molecules without a protein, which is infectious on only plants. So I mentioned briefly that this HLVD, the severity of the disease or the disease symptoms varies by cultivars. And so for the first time it was detected in hop, right? That's the way we call it as hop latent viroids. In hop also, that's the same thing happens. Not all cultivars or not all germplasms show the symptoms. Seven symptoms varies with the, uh, the germplasm and the disease symptoms also vary with that. The other thing to know about HLVD is many times, and in, a very interesting fact about HLVD is that it is latent and it's dominant in the plant. And the plants may grow without any symptoms. And once it expresses the wire art, that's when you start seeing all the other phenotypes that I mentioned. And by that, it's too late. So the earliest detection is the only way to manage and mitigate that virus. And uh, we therefore feel that that's what we want to provide us as a service to our clients. Figure out the way, the most efficient, reliable molecular diagnostic method that can detect HLVD pretty early so that you can curb the you know, uh, spread of the disease and cull those plants before it really matures and spreads in the grow facility. Yeah, I've seen, I've heard of a lot of different cultivars or phenos that don't really show any expression of HLVD, but in other phenos, it's, it's pretty prevalent visually. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in, in a lot of phenos, we're hearing that you know, once you start to bring that plant into flower or stress the plant at all, then it really starts to come out and you start to see it. Why do you think that that is? And I'm not a plant pathologist or molecular pathologist to tell you about the epidemiology of the disease, but you have we have seen that uh, when plants are infected, and they, they go through some sort of stress, which is uh, a nutrient stress or a drought stress or heat stress, the amplification of these uh, pathogens is presented. So the plants then start showing you because it's fighting now two ends. One is the presence of the viroid and the other is the stress that is uh, that plant is to overcome, right, in order to be able to grow and mature and flower. So I think it's a cumulative uh, expression of the phenotype both the presence of the viroid and the plants are trying to defend itself against uh, the viroid and as well as the stress that is going through. So you become susceptible. And we know that in humans that happens, right? When you get uh, a, a common cold, you become uh, more or less prone to any, any secondary infection. Uh, a common cold is called by virus. And often people come with a common cold and then go into a hospital and land up with a bronchitis or uh, with a, uh, I mean, with another infection. So secondary infections do happen very cool. So I think from my understanding is that plants are compromised at that point, and that's why you see the amplified uh, phenotype being expressed with the viroid. Yeah, 
when, when you're, you know, when you get really stressed at work or you've got a lot going on, then, you know, you start to get sick. Mm -hmm. Obviously, same thing for plants. What are some of the most common testing um, protocols for viruses and hoplite and viroid? When you look about diseases, again, this is an interesting question. Because, I mean, the, if the area is really still developing, um, biological indexing is a very common thing to look for pathogens, including viruses and viroid. One has to be a little cautious about biological indexing because of the fact that HLVD is very narrow host and it goes dormant. I said it, it remains latent. So the common use of biological indexing doesn't work. The other interesting thing that to keep in mind is the viroid, when it's infected in the plants, it's not universally or it's not universally spread in the plant. There is a variegation. There are certain tissues which have higher amounts of the virus and certain tissues which do not uh, show the virus. So we need something which is very, very sensitive and as well as reliable while also the robust way of looking at... So when you look at the different methods that have been used in uh, detection of viruses and viroid. You have the QPCR-based methods, the PCR-based methods, which is a polymerase chain reaction. Then you have a QRT-based method, which is a reverse transcriptase, based because this is an RNA virus, I told you, right? And then there are these LAMP, which is a loop-mediated amplification. So these are the very commonly used platforms, and people have used it even for SARS-2, CoVA. I mean, very commonly used right um, so you you can decide based on what you want to spend from your pocket you know which technology you want to apply from our perspective what we want to give our clients is something as I said is uh, affordable cost effective but equally sensitive and reliable which is high throughput so that I, we can throw, go into our labs and do few thousands on a daily basis some of the other technologies you can only handle a few hundred and it comes with a cost associated with it. Uh, it needs much more extensive work, which obviously the labor comes into picture and needs a clean facility to do it. So, and there are also pe uh, companies which are selling kits. You know, you can buy those kits. Uh, I mean, you will need to get a little training and use it. But again, they are not high throughput. And that's a limitation. And its sensitivity is also limited. How, what about the accuracy on, on, the, on the kits, at-home kits? I wouldn't comment on that because, again, I have not used myself. Uh, when you look at, uh, you know, what has been disclosed by the companies, they say it's highly sensitive. But we know as a technologist that the sensitivity is limited. And the fact that you can only handle, you know, six to eight samples doesn't make it easy for anybody who wants to do it in the lab or in the field. So the sensitivity um, may be good. I, 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 won't, I won't comment on that, but the question is how throughput is that for any lab and is it cost effective? Does it pay for the labor that's been put into the lab? And what are the controls that you have that you're running to make sure that your reactions were all perfect? Right. So you know, it's, it depends on how much training is, is given to the person or the personnel who actually optimizes and standardizes the protocol. You're saying your guys' method is is high throughput and affordable. How how much does an average hoplite and viroid testing cost on a cannabis plant? Depends on the volume, depends on the frequency of the testing, and, but can be easily 15 bucks. $15. $15 per sample. Results, they are, the client get normally our, the results in, in two days. Uh, but again, depends on, on the volume of the samples. Uh, it's not the same uh, home grower that wants to analyze uh, three samples every, every month or a nursery or a growing facility that analyzes several thousand of samples every, every week, right? But I would say that the average is might be that. Usually, how does hot latent viroid make it into the tissue of the plant, and then how does it spread to other plants around the facility? Very interesting question, and this is something I think people need to understand. Um, uh, often there is this question about, is it seed or 
pollen borne. There is very low evidence to show that it's seed or pollen borne, these viroids. The most common way of the viroids spreading in the facility, in a grow facility or in, in a breeder's hand is which did he cut in, cutting. So I would say basically there are multiple ways that the viroids can move. Which did he cuttings are most commonly uh, seen um, method for transmission of the viroid. So mother plants can be infected and you're cutting the mother plants. So that's one way of doing it. There are other ways of um, the viroid spread, which is more mechanical. Mechanical where you could have, a, and it comes to the cultivation practices in the facility too. It could be your tools, instruments, and equipment that you use for cutting. And if they are not cleaned and uh, you know hygiene practices are not in place, obviously that becomes easy for the bar artists to stick around. And then there is also this, uh, f- uh, so plants are like, you know, growing, right? So there are injuries or cuttings that, um, abrasions that happen. Virates can easily get through that too. So that's very common, like these mechanical and the cultural practices as the vegetative cuttings. There are reports also about vector transmission. Vector is a vector is basically which carries uh, the viroid. And there are reports like there are root aphids. And root aphids are shown to, I mean, at least people have reported it, that they carry the viroid. There, there is possibility of aphids also, which is also known to be vector for many other viruses. So these are the common ways the viroid, you know, moves in a facility or in a grow area. You guys um, did a lot of research on pathogen diagnostics. What what technologies um, did you did you do the research with? So we just um, uh, release a new or develop a new a new technology that is actually a hybrid of the two most common technologies, uh, which are the the lamp technology and the real-time PCR. So we just, internally, we just develop a new a new hybrid um, that is called uh, MyFlora Detect. That it's a, it's a high-throughput technology. So that means that allow us to analyze several thousand of samples every day. Uh, it's very accurate. Actually, we got the uh, same sensibility that uh, the famous uh, uh, qPCR technology and so that makes that that means that it is very affordable. So that's why we can provide those those competitive uh, prices to our clients. Probably it's, we are the the, the lowest uh, cost, you know, uh, most efficient uh, to our clients. So um, we just develop also a. a a research project that includes uh, 5,000 samples, 5,000 plants. Probably is the largest research study on HLB so far. And um, the results uh, have been published in a scientific journal. Uh, so it's available to any, 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 any reader. And... We are very happy. We are very happy with the technology. We are very happy with the, the sensibility and accuracy of the data, uh, the price that we can that we can provide to our clients, and the, the number of samples that we can analyze uh, in a daily basis. I want to jump in uh, just to sort of elaborate on the fact that we have a very unique technology, which is, as Angel mentioned, is a hybrid between the lamp and uh, a quantity PCR method. So I mentioned to you the quantity PCR is a very sensitive method. Um, what we have done is we combined the ease of LAMP and the sensitivity of the PCR, qPCR-based approach, to be able to provide a highly sensitive and reliable process of being able to detect the viral pretty early. And this study where we actually did were probably the, the first group ever to do this uh, in an R&D is to see the progression of the viral, starting from young age to almost like 12 weeks old plant. These are mother plants. Like that's been cut. Right? To watch the virus grow. Yes, yes. The evolution. How the virus, when can you earliest detect it? Whereas the viroid, the viroid actually amplifies, the titer goes up in the uh, tissue. And is, is that viroid present in the whole plant systematically? Or is it localized into specific tissues or tissue, tissue types, right? And here I want to probably 
put a little thought on how these viroids actually get into the plant. As I was mentioning to you earlier that, you know, viroids normally is this mechanical or vegetative cutting, so which basically tells the aerial parts become prone to the infection. and Most likely the aerial parts are the ones which come in contact with the viroid. And I also mentioned that the viroid is not very systematic in the sense it's not evenly distributed in the plants. So knowing how to sample these tissues, you know, you need to basically take tissues from multiple uh, parts of the plant and then analyze that through this process of what we call as MF detect. And another thing that we have come across is that obviously we have seen in our studies that the titer of the viroid increases, it doubles and triples over a weekly basis. And we have to understand how the viroids also move in the plant. So it's a source to sink, we say. So viroids normally get infected in the aerial tissue, which is probably a leaf, wherever it makes the entry. And then it uh, amplifies because it sort of uh, hijacks the plant DNA replication machinery to get to amplify itself. And then it gets transported into the phloem and from the phloem it moves down. So that's the source to sink and that's how it reaches the lower parts, of, from the upper to the lower parts of the plant. And one of the things I also wanted to make people understand about the viroid is, so as I said, there are multiple steps here, right? The viroid infects a particular tissue, then it <coughs> enters into the nucleus of that tissue, uh, I mean, of the tissue that it infects. In the nucleus, it starts its own replication by uh, using the plant's uh, replication machinery. From there, it moves out of the nucleus. It then gets transported into other tissues, and then it gets pumped into the phloem, and from the phloem it goes down, and again the life cycle starts again. So there are so many different steps, and that's why I think it's very interesting to think about this viroid, just not from a disease point, but also there are only few viroids people have really studied about. So this is making it's more interesting to understand how they have evolved to be able to infect, uh, you know, crops. When you're saying that, you're saying that it doubles strength every week? That, that's what you guys I wouldn't seen. say it doubles the strength, but we... So, like any um, mammalian cell or anything which is infected with viruses, over a course of the life cycle, the virus amplify, like they increase. They and that's how level. They, yeah. they, 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 that's how we start showing disease. Like, for example, if you take a person who's infected with, you know, uh, SARS-CoV-8, the early stage, they may have a few number of molecules are in the uh, human cell. But when they really multiply, that's how they do invasion, right? We have high titers. So in leaf tissue, we have seen over the life cycle of what the, of the experiment I was talking about, the amount of the viroid increases. And so what happens now is it becomes easier. Like if you have few molecules of the viroid versus you have 100, it's easier to detect with any of the even less sensitive systems. Yeah. You talked about a little bit about taking plant tissue from certain parts of the the plant initially, where where are you guys seeing, or where have you learned the best locations of taking tissue from the plant for testing? So I'll go back to in just um, you know mentioning about that study where we did this huge experiment, which was the, one of the largest public uh, work that I've heard about in uh, uh, in terms of studying HLVD in cannabis. So we started off with five thousand uh, plant samples. And uh, we did analyze them with our MF detect method. And then we narrowed down to 600 samples, which came from 50 different plants, which we identified as infected or non-detected. And then we did a time course study, like for different weekly intervals. In this study, we actually included three different tissue types. We took the leaves, again, sampled from the different parts Partial of the plant. The plant. Then we took petioles, then also we took roots. And we did a, a careful study using our MF Detect, which is the LAMP QPS hybrid uh, technology and the more sensitive TACMAN QRT-PCR method. Based on that study, we can tell you that all three tissues are even in terms of detection. But what is interesting in that is 
we, when we initially screened the 5,000 plants, we screened the leaf because that was a recommended um, I mean, uh, SOP or a recommended protocol for our uh, big growers. And this was this was a very interesting study with, uh, which we did with uh, one of the biggest cannabis growers in California. So the sensitivity of the essay is is here in, in the play because again those were five thousand plants pretty early in their growth stages, identifying potentially those who are which are infected and undetected, and then doing a time course tells you that sensitivity of the essay because we are basically trying to show that yes we are were able to detect 98%, 95% confidence that these plants are infected and then showing that, yes, it can, uh, in the, uh, on the weekly basis, hey, they really are truly infected, right? So that's the power of that technology. Now, going to the tissue type, as you said, one thing I mentioned is in the leaves, we tend to see the increase in the title. But in the petiole and the root, we didn't see the same thing. Uh, and again, which tells that, again, leaf is uh, an ideal, a suitable tissue if you want to do it pretty early in the detection. But we also recommend now that, you know, we have seen this source to sink, I told you, the flow and transport, and it's in the root. Any of these three tissues can be, um, it can be used for detection. But the question that comes into mind is, as I said, it moves from the upper parts to the lower part. So right? By the time you pick the root... Maybe it's already infected. It's the too late. Yeah. yeah. So and, uh, early detection has to be directly from the leaf. An early detection. So that that brings to a solution, right? I mean, mm -hmm. a solution would be, I mean, or to test regularly. What do you say every week? Yeah. So that's one of the things that I would say is uh, in a recommendation for anybody who's trying to look at HLVD, right? You have to have a, a management practice. And we are now really interested in finding those partners and collaborators, whether it's in the tissue culture plant or in the mother plants. Can we get those early uh, samples and we can tell them, uh, we can come up with a protocol or a CP on how early should the early detection be? And how early can our diagnostic molecular tools uh, be able to detect it, right? I mean, so we can actually improve our sensitivity too. So as you asked me this question, right, the cultivation management practice or the best management practices would be is routinely on a constant basis, on a weekly basis, sample your material, get through its testing and reduce the amount of infected plants in your facility. That's the only way to reduce the amount of viral load in the plants and also to remove plants which are infected. With your guys' research, and, and you guys found that hoplane viroid st starts at the top and moves down through the plant, did you kind of find how long it takes for, the, for it to move through the plant? Or obviously, does it depend on size? I mean, what, what did you guys learn? It's too early for us to make a conclusive comment on that. Um, and again... What we have seen is we were the first people to really do this systematic sort of study to be able to take uh, young plants, identify if they are infected, and then go and do this um, d tissue, I mean, sampling from different parts of the plant, whether it's PTO leaf and uh, the roots. I think there is more, um, more amount of work needs to be done to be able to take it even earlier. Um, by the time we took it like five, six weeks, we could even see in the roots. So it's already moved. Yeah. But what we are seeing is by the five, six, we doubled and tripled the amount of viroid. Yeah. Right? That hasn't happened in the root and PTO. So, I, I mean, I, don't, I, I can't comment on uh, whether we have a solution, but we have started taking more of a systematic approach to unravel what's happening in the plant and how the viroid and the plant are interacting with each other. Would, would knowing how the virus travels through the plant, would you say for cultivators, it's, you know, not maybe, maybe not the best practice, but a better practice would be to take new cuttings from the bottom of their mothers rather than the top. I mean, is that, I mean, how, what, what am I trying to get at is, is there a solution to kind of getting ahead of the virus once it's detected, right? I don't know whether the answer is that simple. Um, 
my concern would be is if you happen to know that your mother plant is infected, don't even try to use that mother plant for your cuttings because it's probably too late that you can get anything to eradicate from that mother plant. Uh, normally they say that the topper parts of the, like the meristems and meristemoids, uh, meristems are normally uh, free of viruses, but viroids are different. Uh, you can reduce the titer of the plant. Uh, people have uh, used meristem cultures or nodal apical nodes for trying to avoid the amount of you know, viroid content, but the effect is more of a dilution effect. You know, if you really take the meristems and you have to do meristeming a few times, yeah, you can reduce the titer significantly. Um, but coming back to the question of whether they can use the aerial parts or the lower parts, if I'm going to give you a scientific advice, would be uh, if you know the mother plants is, are infected, avoid it. Uh, Angel. Yes, I would say the same thing. I wouldn't use it. You might be lucky, you might not be lucky. Yeah. And have an accident. Anyways, I just wanted to corroborate what the doctor Anand is, is talking. And as a summary, I would probably say, because it's been an open debate about which tissue is the, is the most accurate for pathogen testing. Based on our study, again, the largest one uh, so far, initial samples, 5,000 plants, uh, Root is not best than leaf. That is a major, one of the main conclusions of this study. Uh, you want to really uh, detect the infection at a very early stage, start with leaf. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can add to the same pool uh, a few petioles or even root, but don't discard leaf because um, the data showing the opposite. So that is one of the, the main, the main uh, goals of this, of this study, too, was to, to, to demonstrate that there is not a better tissue than, than, than the other. What advice would you give a new cultivator that wants to start doing regular hot plate enviroid, enviroid testing what what is some advice you would you would give some cultivators? Uh, testing very frequently. That is something that they should they should start start doing. Uh, it can be with one technology, with another technology, with our company, with another company. Uh, home kits, uh, outsourcing to another l uh, lab. But uh, if they want to prevent the, the rate and the, the infection level, they need to start uh, testing. And basically, we have a very recent example, which is uh, COVID. Uh, at one point, every, every individual was testing uh, every week, every month, Right, and that was the only the only way to make sure that you are you are uh, healthy. And so the same thing happens with with plants. Uh, regular testing is the is the point and is the the foundation. If you want to have a a good um, IPM program. Yeah, so I'll just add on that. That's basically what I was telling you. Right? Creating an effective disease management practice, and which is very periodic, very systematic and people invest on that. So it's an effective way to reduce the amount of rate of infection and also reduce the rate of... The other thing that I think obviously is going to be a great opportunity is finding host resistance or resistant mechanisms or breeding for resistance for HLVD. It's in a whole area that you know people can spend time and years, but that's going to be the long-term fix for it. Breeding. To, yeah to identify genes uh, that are offering a yeah. resistant to Cultivars which are resistant, as we talked yeah. about, the sensitivity and the uh, degree of severity of the disease really varies and how the same thing is probably true in cannabis too. That's the main difference when we were talking about uh, cannabis versus the, uh, the rest of uh, other crops. The other crops, they have been 
they have been doing research uh, for many, many, many years, decades, yeah. and breathing and molecular biology and so on. So at the end, obviously, they got the resistant varieties. With breathing, uh, with cannabis, the breathing uh, history is very limited, very, very limited. There is not a real foundation. So it will, it will, it will, it will sure. be there in the next few years, hopefully. And I But think this is also an opportunity. We are like openly saying, you know, we are looking for collaborators. We are looking for partners who want to work with us because, as I said, I mean, we are a science-based company. We have got such a talent in our in-house and smart brains, brains which have put 50 plus years on the molecular biology, molecular diagnostics, genomics, we really can be a big players because for us it's learning. All that I told you is my last year and a half of exposure to cannabis, right? Uh, if I had the same 12, 13 years of experience working like what we worked in row, row crops, it's, it's a lot of immense knowledge that we have which we can sort of provide this community, but we need partners. We need people who want to work like the work we did with a uh, huge cannabis grower on the disease progression, HLV detection. We love to hear from people who can work with us because at the end of the day, we want to make it feasible in terms of giving more, I mean, creating more business value and as well as understanding the disease. This is one disease. There's going to be more diseases that are going to come into cannabis. Are you you guys currently working with any breeders right now that are? Yeah, we have several collaborators. Uh, now, but... are are they um, doing fingerprint ID with you guys? That's correct. Are you, do you guys feel comfortable talking about what you yeah, guys are doing yeah, with yeah. fingerprint? Yeah, yeah. This is another technology that we just, uh, well, a few months ago we, we released. We have a patent pending uh, application. It's something very novel. Uh, hasn't been applied, hasn't been actually discovered in, actually in any other crop. The technology itself, but the way that uh, we represent the data is very unique and novel. Um, Why do you say it's novel? Oh, because actually uh, not any other university or nurseries or even major uh, agricultural companies applying this, this digital visualization. So this is a way to protect and to authenticate the, the purity and the uniqueness of a, of a new strain or, or a new cult, uh, cultivar. It can be cannabis, or it can be soybean, it can be almond, it can be cherry. So the, the, the main idea is to, to, to provide that uh, differentiation to the breeder and to the breeder actually it's, it's, it's a long and a very difficult job and they are artists and every time that they develop a new strain, and, uh, they need a protection. They need to protect their, their art. So with this technology, we help them to protect that uh, That wonderful thing that they have created. And this is based on molecular markers, on DNA molecular markers. So as I was saying earlier, this is, uh, we are generating the social security number for each plant. And that's the way to demonstrate to the public uh, or to the, to, the, to the industry that what they have created is unique. No one else has the same thing. And uh, it's also useful to identify fraudulent activities. So if you as a breeder have created something and your neighbor has gotten that uh, strain and has made a new cross, we can identify, or even he has just renamed the, your strain, we can identify that is the same thing and that belongs to you. So it's a proof of... Uh, Uh, authentication. And you also kind of pick out traits like resistant to? No, no, at this level. Not so at this, this level. Is, this, I mean, we could, but this is not the main goal of this technology. The main goal, the main, the main purpose of this technology is 
to certificate the authentic the, the the uniqueness of your cultivar. If you want to identify new genes, or you want to breed for resistant genes or for quality genes or for uh, drought stress, whatever, we can target those genes and we can create a, a new strain that has those yeah. those traits. But just for protection, authentication, this is like an ISO what we are trying to provide to the clients that uh, quality control. Yeah, again, Angel mentioned, it's a, providing them a social security or a digital ID. We are not into identifying trade genes. We are not going to work on that aspect until, I mean, this information is owned by the breeder or the cultivator. We don't own it, okay? And our idea is enrich them, enable them to make the decision of how to keep the germplasm or the, the, their cultivar unique. So say I'm a, a breeder and I come out with a genetic, let's say it's lemon cherry gelato mm-hmm. and I have my lemon cherry gelato that I crossed um, and I want to get a fingerprint DNA. Walk me through what that looks like as a breeder. Where do they start? How does it all flow through and what do they get at the end? The process is very simple. So they just need to send us one leaf of the plant. Basically, as with HLV, they are sending us a pool of uh, uh, plant tissue. With fingerprinting, we just need one leaf. The DNA is going to be the same in the root, in the leaf, in the petiole. We are not talking here about the... uh, um, pathogen distribution. DNA is the same. So they just need to send us a leaf. The process takes uh, three to five days and by the end of the day they will get a certificate with the social security number based on DNA uh, markers. Uh, as you can see here in this image. Uh, and this is going to be unique to any other uh, breeding line or, or any other cultivar that you might have done in the past. Even if you cross, even if you cross the same strain, uh, the DNA profile is going to be different. Cross the same strain with another strain. It's a new yes. DNA profile. Yes. It's like basically uh, your parents, they have to, exactly, you have a sister, your DNA information is different to your sister, right? So it's, it's the same concept. So I'm a, I'm a pheno hunter or I'm a breeder and I sent you my plant that I either pheno hunt or I bred and pheno hunted that. And I have my certificate. Okay. My certificates in digital or in hand. And then it's a digital, a digital, it's a digital that you can even upload that on blockchain. So that means that no one can modify and so now I'm a, I'm a breeder that wants to sell my cultivar and it's called lemon cherry gelato. And I sell my cultivar out and to an exclusive set of individuals and those individuals, how would they verify that that's the real lemon cherry gelato? So they have an option to validate, um, they validate the same cuttings let's say, and if they get the matching, 100% matching by using the same technology, that means that they are using the real one, the real cultivar. So those, those, those individuals will send you a leaf mm-hmm. and then my, DN, my floral DNA will come back and say 100% match. What does something like that cost for those, those users that, that get that cultivar? How much it costs? Yeah, yeah, about, yeah how So much? it depends on the volume, but it can be for around $150 okay. or even, even less, depends, depends on the volume. Again, everything comes down to the volume, yes. right? The yeah, more right. we can actually provide, we have more sampling, the less we can make it, uh, I mean, yeah. the lesser is the cost of that. So the input to output cost varies on based on... But it's actually a very... Uh, cost-efficient way to protect and to demonstrate to the industry for $150 or even less again that you have something unique and what you have is different to what the others they have. Mm-hmm. So, and, and another thing is 
when the people who are growing this breeders line are with a you know is it a new cultivar or a new fino hunt for you call uh all that they need is pull the leaf um if they have this questionable thought about hey did i get the right one just pull a few samples together put in a little tube and send it over what kind of information do you usually give out you know do you tell the breeder or cultivar that is starting his library with you like is a uh, plant virus free do you give it do you give them any information on growth characteristics or what to expect or or anything like that we are not growers and the the characteristics they need to be provided by the client we are just molecular scientists we are experts in that field and this is what we what we do so if they want the certificate they will have to to provide the agronomical information including a picture but this is more for aesthetics for them but the real value here is the is the the dna information the, the genetic profile do you guys mind me asking how on on a breeder side of things how who's what's your largest library with one breeder of of cc what do you call it ccis hmm. certificate of cultivar identification mm-hmm. so we have breeders that they have probably 300 400 samples and 400 cultivars, cultivars with one breeder yeah yes yeah yes i mean that includes also their gene bank so those are breeders that they have their own germoplasm and they just wanted to also to, 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 to know the, the genetic distance, the genetic relationship between one strain and, you know, and other strains. So by the end also they can request a phylogenetic tree. So we are, we are basically uh, offering customized uh, outputs. So if you are a breeder with uh, 500 samples and you want to know the genetic relationship between all your uh, cultivars, we can develop a, a phylogenetic tree and, and they can find out the distance, the genetic distance between one and the other. So that information is really relevant because based on that, they can design the, the new uh, experimental designs for the breeding projects. So... You know, once we generate the data, uh, how we provide that to the client, it really depends. We are very open. This is bioinformatics. Uh, we have a group of bioinformaticians in the, in the team, so this is a matter of a couple of hours. So mm-hmm. we are very flexible to, to that. And what's really cool is um, you don't have access to the cultivar because you're testing a leaf. You can't, you can't, you, ha- you don't have that cultivar that's not we yours. Have, no, we cannot no. to multiply, we cannot to grow a plant, a new plant from a leaf. That is very, very important to, to mention. Uh, we cannot to do magic, right? So <laughs> we no, have, you can't you can't tissue culture a leaf. No, you and, cannot. And, yeah. and pull a, a new plant out of yes. it. So I think that's really important because, you know, being a breeder, your business revolves around exclusivity of your your cultivars Mm -hmm. and you don't want anybody to to own those of course but you still want the fingerprint of the cultivar and you want to be able to you know have an organized organized foundation and a list of all your certificate of cultivars um but without giving anybody your cultivar so that's that's really really cool that you guys are doing that that's really neat as far as do you think that this program and the CCI will help brands do licensing deals with other facilities to grow their cultivars? Do you think that would be something that's integrated? I think so. We see a lot of potential with this technology for branding companies too, uh, and even for the, for the consumers. The consumers, they want to, to get a specific strain that works with their physiology. And, and, and if they spend money in, in one strain, they want to get that strain and they don't want to get another strain. So again, this is like a, like a, it's going to be like a certificate level for, for branding products and the branding industry. 
I mean, imagine in a scenario where the customer says, I really need gelato. I really need uh, this particular cultivar. They come and want to have it. You basically have like a QR code in the packaging that they can have the absolute confidence. This is the real stuff, right? Because I have an a code here that tells me, hey, this is a certification of this unique cultivar that I'm looking for. And that's what I have in this product. So you're saying even on the end user, mm -hmm. the end user wants lemon cherry gelato, right? You as a cultivator, say, you know, you're doing a licensing deal with a brand mm -hmm. and you're cultivating in the state of Missouri and, um, the end user can then, you can, as a cultivator, put the My Floral DNA uh, QR, QR code. code on the packaging. And the end user can scan that QR code and verify 100% that they're smoking the real lemon cherry gelato mm -hmm. from the real brand. Mm -hmm. That's really neat. That's really cool. Is that is that the... I mean, that, that's the that's scope of this whole thing. As this evolves, you know, everybody likes to have an authentication of what they are consuming, right? Whether as a consumer, we go into the stores and aren't branded and stuff, and we know whether it's a, a certified X material, a certified um, material without, uh, say, hormones, right? In milk products or in your eggs. This is the same level of uh, You want to know the origin also, where it's coming yeah. from, so you can well, get all it, that information. Yeah. Who is the grower? Who, where did it come from? I mean, this information all can go into a blockchain too as well. I mean, I see a potential opportunity to really um, have a, a tractable way of finding where the product came and where, how it landed into my store. That's really neat. That changes the game across the board mm -hmm. as far as for the breeders, the end users, mm -hmm. the licensees, right? This is big. Yeah, it's really big. And I would also add on to some of the things that right now we were saying that we're giving this fingerprints for our customers, right? I mean, our whole idea is nothing is going to be with us. And I told you in the beginning that the owner is going to be the client who gave the material. He is going to be the owner of all the information we give. It comes into our hands. We do the fingerprinting. It goes into the cloud. It's up to them to decide what they want to do with. We are not into the discovery path right now. We are not going to go into looking at what's the different things that are unique about it. But that is a potential area for us to open with our partner who wants to now spend time saying, hey, can I expand this work? Uh, I'm interested in uh, water, res I mean, uh, drought resistance, or I want to have HLVD resistance. I've seen this cultivar, which this phenotype is very resistant, or this genotype is very resistant to HLVD. Can we work together? We have to expand our capabilities. Right with this, we are limited. But that's a, verb, a partnership, a collaboration comes in picture, right? And that expands the cap cap capabilities of using this technology. This technology has been used for many crops. I'm going to tell you that. They talk about pan, pan genomes in other crops like rock crops. That's, you know, the whole thing is open here yeah. for cannabis. That's really, really neat. It's really neat that, you know, the future is to, to work next to cultivators and figuring out traits that they see in their plants and then working closely with you to kind of see where those traits are coming up from on a DNA perspective so they can then use those traits for other phenos. Mm -hmm. That would be really neat. What on an in intellectual property basis... I mean, are you seeing people protect their cultivars um, being with the federal law of where it is? Are you seeing um, growers protect their genetics and in protecting their intellectual property? Um, I mean, now this is the new tendency and this is more for, uh, this is a question for a patent attorney um, but that is going to be the, the way to go. Exactly as they are doing in, in, in tomato, they are doing that in, in cherries uh, or soybean or rice. They are doing they it. They are protecting basically every new cultivar or every new variety. They should. They should. So again, if you, you are an artist, you want to protect your, your, your art, or you are a, your son, 
as a, as a musician, you want to protect your son, right? So it's the same thing. You are creating something unique. They have to. Are they are they mostly protecting traits, or are they protecting the actual fingerprint? Something like, I mean, could you use the f- your fingerprint DNA? Possibly, I'm not saying right now, but in the future to to add some intellectual property. So PVP is a very common thing in many of the crops that people say plant varietal protection, right? It's it's a legitimate reason to say, hey, I have this inbred or I have this hybrid, I, I own this. And that's how big seed industries work around it. That so applies to anything. So you don't protect actually the DNA. What you do, you, what you protect is the plant. And the yes. plant, so you are creating something new. And something new means with with new agronomical incorporations. So you have to include in the in the patent application, you need to include all those phenotypic and morphological uh, traits. But now you have the possibility to add an extra layer, which is the molecular or the DNA uh, information. Because when... Imagine two breeders, they want to protect, the, imagine the same, the same variety, variety that they have resistant to power mildew, high VTHE, um, uh, drought stress. So in, uh, the, in the description, to, it can be very, very, very similar, even identical, right? However, at the molecular level, it's going to be different or identical. So if it's identical, that means that one uh, stole this from the other, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's the only way to to protect any kind of organism. What do you guys see as being your biggest challenges with fingerprint DNA in the cannabis industry? Because it's it's quite a bit different than than other crops, right? You're, you've got a lot of limitations. At what level? On just just challenges in general, do you see any challenges being a part of the cannabis industry? Yes, we've seen nurseries that they provide a wrong tissue or wrong plants to their clients. So the clients they just wanted to verify that they got the wrong material, but. The nursery itself didn't even know that they were growing the grown material. So that happens a lot. Why? Because they don't have, they don't have a, a, a protocol or a technology to identify the material that they are growing. That's why this as a, um, a inventory tool for those nurseries or even tissue culture labs, is extremely useful. Because first of all, you need to identify what you have at home. Yeah. And be 200% sure that what you are claiming to have is what it is. What it is. Once you have that confirmation is when you can start selling, growing, multiplying to your clients. So sometimes they don't know what they have at home. Yeah. And this is a big challenge for them, actually. For for pheno hunters and and breeders, what what advice would you guys give to get them started in building their their book, their library with fingerprint ID? My thought again, from my perspective, I like to see breeders and growers catalog their cultivars create an inventory that they know and they can, you know, provide evidence to say, hey, this is what I have in my grow facility. And there is a huge benefit on doing that is the fact that we have always come in the world of other crops. We have gone back to the uh, the genetic databases that are created by this to look for something novel that eventually gets incorporated. So, Having inventory, getting a certification of that, knowing what the different types and pools of germplasm you have is the first and the foremost thing you want to do. Both protecting your germplasm and also making sure that people are using the right material, which is true to type, right? 
Yeah. Uh, from my perspective, that's a big thing. And then you can expand it to it. Hopefully there isn't time, but there won't be too many uh, cultivars that people are growing based on you know the information that's been exchanged. From the education point of view, you start getting the... I mean, obviously there's something the patent lawyers can expand on. You're getting plant varietal protection that you know you own it, you designed it, you developed it, and nobody can reproduce it. So, you know, you want that as well as another added layer of safety if you are a true breeder. With this technology, let me add that with this technology, you can track back also if somebody has been using your variety as a, as a parent material or as a mother or whatever. So you can actually trace uh, in the new progenies or in the new cultivars if they have been using your material as a foundation of the breeding program. So if they are supposed to pay you royalties or whatever business you have with them, uh, you can find out that very easily. Yeah. yeah. And also even the, f the fact that we're talking about in the final product, all that you need is a little DNA. Yeah, it's neat. What you guys are doing is really neat. I think it's going to help out a lot of breeders and, and guys that are pheno hunting and want to build a library. Um, Dr. Fernandez, you're, you're writing a book right now? That's correct. I'm the editor-in-chief of the uh, Cannabis Genome. It's going to be a very, very interesting book, and I'm super proud. Um, all the co-authors and, and all the scientists that they are participating in this book is going to include uh, very interesting topics, from taxonomy to business to classical breathing, molecular breathing, genomics. And all around, around the cannabis genome. Just cannabis, exactly. That's really neat. Yes. That's so it's going to be a very completed uh, book. And, and what I like is that there are many, many scientists and also uh, players in the industry participating in the book. So it's not just uh, written by me. Uh, so that is going to be a very... A very powerful book. Very renowned scientists, worldly known figures, breeders, you know, people who are in the industry. We're trying to get everybody involved in that. Yeah. And I said, cannabis is the fifth largest crop. It needs attention. It so, needs. Yeah, I wanted to. I wrote that down. So cannabis is the fifth largest crop right now. Had yeah, it's it's uh, getting to that point. Yeah. Is that in revenue or square footage? I mean, it would probably be revenue. It right? probably is revenue. Yeah, revenue. Yeah, I mean, square footage, we are very localized. I don't localized. think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're pretty small, yeah, I think, yeah. as far as square Valiant footage. Revenue, yeah. yeah. But in revenue, it's the fifth largest crop. Yeah, and it's it's going to double to triple, right? Maybe. I w w we hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really interesting. Do you have a, what's the book, do you have a name for the book yet? Or? Cannabis Zinoma. It's called The Cannabis Genome. The Cannabis Genome will be released by the end of this year. Uh, the Francis Ann Taylor is the the publishing Publishers. the publisher. You're gonna send me a copy, right? Of course. You're sign it. <laughs> I, I expect a signed copy. Of course. <laughs> Appreciate you guys. Uh, thanks for making the trip out from Sacramento and making it down to uh, to talk about what you guys are doing. It's exciting, and uh, I'm excited to share it. So, Thank you very much, sure. Brandon. Thanks for, for taking your time, taking making your time for us uh, to you know give you a little bit of what we have acquired in this area, knowledge, yep. and it's been a absolute, uh, I mean, opportunity for us to come here and share with you some of our stories. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. See ya.